The end. January 27th, 2016. One. I haven't quite figured out what I will do with this notebook, yet, besides this. I feel a little guilty writing in it, actually, as my handwriting is atrocious, and this book is very nice. This notebook is started as I was committed, technically on a voluntary basis, to Lakeland Hospital Psychiatric Ward. It was given to me early, originally intended as a Valentine's Day gift, or part of one, for my girlfriend Kay. It's quite lovely, and I'm happy to have it. Seeing her and my parents in so much pain over my being here has been heart-wrenching. I look forward to getting out of here, seeing them feel better. Also, it kind of sucks. 2. I suppose it would be useful, if I decided to share this or read it later, to explain the events leading up to my admittance to the psych ward, which I now find capitalized as if it were a proper title. It certainly feels as if it could be one. It's a haunting and damning label to the world outside, or, I suppose, I digress, however, which I will continue to do at later points with some certainty. As I said earlier, it does suck. 3. I will start with the events leading up to my admission, or admissions, counting all of this. The 26th of January, in the year of our Lord, 2016. I went to the doctor at 4 p.m., her NP, in red, light brown skin and freckles, a very warm woman. I was in quite a poor state, and she prevented my chest from exploding while we waited for the ambulance to come and get me. The ambulance, she called. We talked about chemistry. I always like to talk chemistry to someone who wants to listen. I always like to talk to someone who actually wants to listen. The opportunity is rare. Perhaps this is why I find myself here. Kay was with us too. I was reminded of how terrible titrating is. I would explain it here, but I am already tired, and I do not wish to sing myself the lullaby of drip, 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 fuck. I have to start over. Four. A couple of police officers stopped in to check me for weapons. The link between suicidal and homicidal is thinner than I believed. They were friendly enough, as reassuring as they can muster to a stranger. The MTs arrived shortly after. There was a larger, older man, short crop gray hair, and a younger man, medium brown hair, pilot, flight attendant. I was strapped to a gurney at the legs with full control of my arms, a mechanical people table, covered in a cream blanket, swaddled around me like a half baby, half failing man, like suddenly the world was terrifying and new. Side note. I feel as if I am not qualified to write something I will share on this, as I expect my stay will be short, and I feel low, but not quite sober in thought. Perhaps this may give me some greater insight, however, and in the end, someone ought to. Not that no one has, but it's unfamiliar to most, and I feel some guilt over not being worse off. It's really quite a silly thing, probably attached to the general stigma attached to depression. I do realize I am, though an odd thing for an agnostic to say, blessed in many ways. I am loved, I am educated, I am creative, I am charming, and I am capable. All of this somehow just makes me feel guilty, and then I feel guilty about feeling guilty. 5. Kay drove behind the ambulance. It didn't have the sirens on. Disappointing, but understandable unless it showed up on the bill. I had watched some show, and was secretly hoping my life would suddenly become like TV. Funny, light, and able to be contained within a 40 minute time frame. I was met with reassurances during the ambulance ride. It was very warm, but I refused to acknowledge or complain. My flight attendant relayed to me a message. He told me the story of the time he almost took his life. Stories more brutal than tragic without context. Violence without empathy, like peeking through someone's window, even if they open the curtains, you feel like a shameless pervert for watching, without trying to hide the reality. He had held up a knife to his neck and started cutting, until his dog rubbed up against his leg. The thought of it still makes me rub at an invisible wound, as if it were my own. I've never been fond of sharp objects. My saving grace. 6. We waited in the ER for an exhausting amount of time. Four hours. K. And eventually her mother waited with me until my parents came. Substitute mourners. Two hours away from the hospital at a good drive. An inconvenience I often feel guilty about. I fluctuated between periods of extreme stillness and unbearable agitation. I tapped my hands or my feet. This always seemed to unsettle the substitute mourners. January 28th, 2016. One, I don't know how many times my vitals were taken that day, how many different nurses and doctors I'd passed through. 
I felt as if there was something profoundly wrong with me, like I was about to die, and everyone was trying to figure out how to stop it, or maybe just making funeral arrangements. My blood pressure, heartbeat, blood work, piss work, weight, height, favorite color. So many questions asked of me, me who is without any answers. I remember feeling so desperate to figure out what was going to happen to me. It was strange to feel so out of control yet, so fully aware I could do nothing about it. Terrifying and relieving. Two, four hours before I was moved to the psych ward, I remember signing some involuntary admission form, but I had signed so many things by that point, it was hard to keep track. I was wheeled over by an older nurse with strange speech patterns, parents following behind. My saving grace that night, talking to me as I cried in my bed. He brought me food and something to help me sleep. I did, though I eventually went out to find a book that night. Some trashy murder mystery. James Patterson, I think. The kind of book that felt like a poorly worded summary of another, better book. Stiff and rehearsed. Still, I was happy to have it. A token of escape. A normalcy. 3. I woke up the next morning confused. Too confused to be scared. I was asked if I wanted to take a shower. It took me frighteningly long to say yes, but I did. I was given a small hand towel and washcloth. I thought to grab the bottle of wash I'd been provided. The shower was covered by a medical looking green curtain. The water came out alarmingly cold, but eventually warmed. The effect was still strange, like washing in a gym shower. I tried to dry myself off as thoroughly as possible. I had the t-shirt I had worn in and a pair of one size fits all stretchy pants, medical blue. Four, I went back to my room, or at least where I was sleeping, and set down my old clothes. They had finally checked my clothes late last night, and I was able to put on a pair of real pants. Brown corduroys, which one of the other patients later complimented me on. A wiry blonde, must have been in her mid-thirties, but had the energy of a child. She had dreads and beads in her hair. It gave her a presence that did not seem welcome among the downtrodden flock. 5. It doesn't seem so far from real life to feel like the sanest person in the room. I remember slumping down into the rec room. It felt so bright and lonely. Hard furniture, everything so clean. Decorations calculatedly uncalculated. I was waiting for breakfast, I think. It seemed like hours before any other human being chose to reside in that space. There was an air of uncertainty that whole time, like no one knew where they were truly supposed to be. I sat alone. I was served rubbery eggs and wet oatmeal. I ate slowly and cautiously, like each bite might cause some atrocity. I didn't speak to another patient until the first psychotherapy group at 8.15. Before that, I was pulled into the office by the psychiatrist. I missed goal setting. Oh no. January 30th, 2016. I got out Thursday the 28th, I think. Ended up skipping a day in this thing. Tired of writing. And there, I think, I almost did it out of some kind of survival instinct. Trying not to die of overwhelming boredom. It's rarely something I have a problem with. Hell, I could just do the same activities at home and be perfectly satisfied. But something about having no other choice. The farther away from the events that happened, the more likely fiction is to creep its way in. I'm okay with that. We all write our own histories. January 31st, 2016. Where I left off. Psychiatrist office. Dr. G. A reserved man. Black slacks and a white shirt with close cut, gray hair. He spoke as his outfit would presume. Honestly, he spoke as if he might have been as doped up as the patients. The first thing he asked me was to take a seat. I don't remember specifics, talking about my terrible job, him agreeing with me, he prescribed me some Prozac, and then I left. February 1st, 2016. Seems like the post-depression happy high is starting to wear off today. That means I'm gonna have to get back at trying at it like a normal person. I still feel blessed, and my mental state gives me a little vacation, not that I'm getting paid for it. I got denied FMLA, or short-term disability. That means that I get to resign earlier. I'm sure that will be a fun time. I'm still damn emotional. I'll cry at the drop of a hat. Mostly about good things. Still, hard to be like that out in the real world. So hopefully I can figure that out. Still happy to be alive.